Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on optimizing WordPress, making it faster, more accessible, and more secure. Um, I always introduce the webinars, uh, my webinars, by um, introducing the background image. And so this image in the background is called the Singapore Super Trees. Um, they're such an amazing um, sculpture. I, I, I won't talk about them, but I do recommend following the link on the run sheet um, to have a look at those. They were designed by Grant Associates um, and Anthea 1 and Anthea 10. So we've got ourselves a fancy WordPress website. You're actually responsible for your WordPress tech. You still have some housekeeping. So the idea, idea of what we want is we want to make it fast, secure, accessible, and we want a plan B. Uh, there's also some services that are available which are managed WordPress services, managed hosting. So they're really limited. So just really look into the details if you're looking at using one of those. Um, managing systems of this complexity um, is quite expensive. So uh, if, if it's a cheap service, you're probably not getting the management that you're expecting. Um, Specialists managing hosting, such as uh, WP Engine, um, Kinster, and a few others, they um, will help. They will manage your plugins and software to a point, and you still need to do some management and that sort of stuff there. Now, if you really don't want to go through the complexity or go through anything that we're doing here, then uh, I recommend that you search for something we call software as a service, which I discuss uh, in the WordPress fundamentals web webinar which is uh, wordpress.com, for example, and there's other software services which you may want to um, look into. The first step to all of this is we want to have some disaster planning. And this is planning what to do when things go wrong. So in that context, um, we've, we did, I went through disaster planning in detail in the domains hosting email and setting up websites webinar. Okay, so here is an example disaster plan. And um, I've previously gone through this. So you can go and have a look at this in your own time. In today's webinar, I'm gonna be talking more detail about various components of this. Um, but yeah, you can go and have a look at that in your own time. So securing your website. There's been a massive increase recently of um, hacking spam. Uh, we've got, I'm running about 40 websites on our action skill server, which we um, host for free. And what we've been noticing is that a lot of our websites are actually getting more traffic from hackers than they are from actual people. And so what they're doing is they're just trying to get in there. Um, so the automated bots. Um, and so they're trying to get into the website so they can put search optimized search spam on there, but they're also looking at wanting to, um, wanting to put like um, viruses and infect things and um, all sort of bad sort of things. So you really don't want them in your website. Um, they'll generally break stuff. So it, it's almost guaranteed that you'll be getting, people will be attempting to hack your website. Don't take it personally, it's not your politics, it's just the way it is. Um, I've, I had a case when we were doing testing on a server where I put a site live and within, um, within the day, there was, there was hack attempts at that site. So the biggest things that will get your website hacked or the, the most breaches are bad passwords and updates. So that's the vast majority of hack attempts will simply be bad passwords. And I'm gonna jump into this website, um, have I been pawned? So if you come to here and you type in your email address, and what this comes up is that all the, this email address has been on websites that have been breached. So in this case, there's been seven websites where these details have been leaked. Uh, saying that no paste, so that means that they've been uploaded to the internet. So if you use the same password, then it's likely another site that um, you've used it on has been hacked and therefore the hackers have access to it. It's important for your um, passwords to use upper, uppercase, lowercase numbers, special characters, and to make it long. Now, um, on the run sheet, there's um, a guide on how to create a strong password. I recommend give that a read. Um, it's quite detailed, so, um, but it's in uh, easy to use language. And it's um, essential that in this day and age that you have a password manager. Now, yes, all your eggs are in one basket, so that's a negative thing. However, um, 
that is offset by the human brain. I mean, unless you're one of those freaky people, it can actually remember multiple complex passwords. So it's far safer to have um, all your eggs in one basket in that context. Um, so I'm using Dashlane or use part, um, LastPass, but here is a, um, a, a um, review of them all. So basically you put all your passwords in there. It's actually a lot easier because it helps you log in automatically. You can also put credit card um, details, so it helps you and dresses and those sort of things. So it's much more efficient. Okay, so uh, updates. It's really important to update your WordPress website. And we went uh, through that in the WordPress fundamentals, but basically when you log into your WordPress, there'll be an updates in the admin in the top left, and it'll be like a, a red circle, and that'll tell you to update your software. Now the update cycle works like this. Because uh, WordPress is open source, there'll be bad guys that look for holes and security flaws. Then the good people, they fix it. They release an update. Then the bad people, they look for more holes. The good people, they fill them and update. And there's just this loop and loop loop that just keeps going on and on and on. So that's that means that if you haven't updated your website, there's actual known holes. So that means the robots that are automatically hacking, trying to hack your website, they're programmed to target those holes. So if you've got a bad password, then the, the robots will be able to brute force attack it and get in. If you've got, un, if your website hasn't been updated, then they'll use one of those security flaws to get in. So the most key things, if you have WordPress, you must have strong password and you must update all your software. Now that goes for everything in digital life, your laptop, your mobile phone, all your software. Okay, so if you've got lots of websites, um, then I recommend this tool, uh, Manage WP, and I've got mine open here. So here I'm managing um, 50 odd sites. Uh, what's in here? Um, 67 sites. Um, so that means that I can um, click update. So I'll come to the update screen here. And then I can click update and keep all those websites updated. So this is a freemium tool. So that means there's a free service and then there's paid add-ons. This is a great tool if you're um, updating multiple websites. I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, another tool that you can use is Jetpack. Um, just Jetpack with WordPress.com. Uh, when you set up a WordPress.com account, which is still you can use for your .org, then this will allow you to update multiple websites. Um, I find that interface not as nice, but um, sure, it's, um, it's worth looking at as well. Uh, SSL. So this is the padlock up the top left here. This near your, so if you click on here, it's got HTTPS. Now I explain this in a lot more detail in the basics of website tech webinar. Um, however, I just wanted to show you this tool, um, which is why no padlock. So what you can do is if your SS, if you've got an SSL installed and it's still coming up with errors, then this website will allow you to debug your website and then actually be able to get your, um, figure out what the errors are. What they usually are is an image that's been uploaded and the address hasn't updated. So it's still using the HTTP um, protocol. Um, and apologies, I'm going fast, but I've got quite a bit to go through today. Um, and two-factor authentication. So this is a concept um, that is across all of your, uh, again, digital life. So this is where you have two methods to log in. So for example, when I log into my bank, I've got my username password, but then I've also got an app on my phone and that has another um, code on it. So that means that hack into my bank, you've got to um, hack my password. We've also got to either hack my phone or hack my app. So it just makes it a lot harder. A basic uh, version of two-factor authentication is when you log into somewhere and they'll send you a text or they'll send you an email. So you can set up WordPress to have two-factor authentication um, systems on that. Um, which makes things a lot more secure. Okay, so another thing that makes WordPress a real secure um, a security breach is just rubbish scripts on your server. Um, so I showed you the file um, system in the, um, the, the um, internet tech webinar. So basically, if you've, if, if you've had different software besides WordPress on your server and that's been left there and you've installed WordPress on top of that, those old scripts are still active um, and they can still be hacked. 
So I looked in a client's website, they couldn't open up their WordPress admin. I looked into their server and they just had heaps of old scripts. They are all going to be um, a security flaw. Also old versions of websites. So sometimes people might make a copy of their WordPress and just leave it on their server. So that means they're, they're running an old version of WordPress, which means a hacker can actually exploit that, then get into your server and then jump into your website. Uh, also, you don't want any unsecured backups on your server. So if you've, wherever your backups go, make sure that they're not publicly accessible. And if they are, that they're encrypted. Um, so if, you, if you're just starting out with WordPress, you won't need to worry about any of this. This is more for if you've got old, old websites or you've, you've had your website up for quite a while. If, you're, uh, if plugins that you're using or themes haven't been updated, so for example, if you're using a plugin um, for a calendar, for example, and that hasn't been updated in three years, and there's an exploit on some of the techniques that they've used, then that would be a way to hack into the website. So you want to try and make sure that your plugins and themes are, um, are being updated as well as you updating them. The actual developers are updating them. Uh, and it may be a case you may need to just update your and change and use a different plugin if that one's not, um, not being updated. And be very careful of plugins that give upload permissions. So for example, there might be some sort of file uploader or um, a file directory. Because what these plugins will do is give, um, will loosen your security around being able to upload things to your server. And so that means that a hacker can use that to upload scripts, which could then use, be used to hack, to hack the um, server. Um, so I tend, generally will not install anything that um, allows more permissions to be um, uploaded on the server. So just be very careful of that side of things, um, especially if you don't understand what it's doing. Okay. So that's um, the basics um, things that were, that will get WordPress hacked. So if you've got all that in place, then you've got reasonable security. Now I'm saying that though, in, to, in, in the modern context, that's not enough. Because as I said, there's always hacker spam trying to get on, onto your website. So um, I'm now gonna talk about WordPress security plugins. These are very various plugins that are used to help secure. Now, be careful of any plugins that do scanning on your website. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the caching section and I've talked about it um, in previous webinars. But basically, if you've got a script or a plugin that's scanning, so if they're scanning for viruses, if they're scanning for um, changes in permissions, scanning for changes in files, that means your server is constantly working. And that really will slow your um, website quite substantially. So I recommend that you have uh, any sort of scanning switched off, or if you do think that you need scanning, um, that you have it set to a certain time where you're gonna get the less traffic on your server. You definitely wouldn't want um, at your peak time to be having a, uh, your website scanned for viruses. If you've got your website locked down, then viruses are, are less of an um, issue anyway, um, because that's if your website has been hacked. But we're gonna make sure it doesn't get hacked in the first place, which is really what we want. Um, and one of the main tools that, uh, that other plugins use is Security. And Security, let me share screen. Security also has its own, um, has its own uh, plugin. So this is an interesting tool because you can, um, you can just go there uh, and, you can install the plugin and do your own scanning. So I recommend if you wanted to do virus scanning that you actually use the security plugin, you do a um, scan when you want, switch that plugin off, or you may schedule it to do it at a reasonable time. Rather than using say another plugin like iTheme Security, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, that will, um, that will do that for you. And what this does is it scans all your files for viruses. It's, it's simply like a virus scan on your, on your PC. Um, and if anything, if your website's been hacked, there's anything nasty in there, it will let you know. Um, so that's one part of it. So um, I'm going to just show you um, WordFence. Um, this is Vault Press. And here's a, a blog on the, what they're saying, 16 best security plugins. Now, Kinsta actually run uh, managed WordPress hosting. So the less hacking on their server, the more money they save. So they're actually um, 
they're wanting secure environments that actually benefits them. So this would be a respected blog on security. Um, I'm just going to keep this webinar not too much detail. So what I thought I'd do is I'd actually give you a tour of, um, of iTheme security and just explain some of the settings there um, that you'll be looking for in a security plugin. So you may, um, may not use iThemes. Um, WordFence, the good thing about WordFence, it's a freemium. It's got a free version as well as a paid version. Um, VaultPress um, is, a, is a, pay, uh, a freemium as well. So if you install Jetpack, it'll give you some security options and then you can pay for more. And I'll go through that in a little bit more. So I'm just going to jump to iTheme Security. This is the Action Skills website. Um, and this is a security plugin that I've um, installed. And I put this on every website that I install. Um, and I'm just going to go through some of the settings so you can get an idea of what these plugins are doing. Okay, Notification Center. So I, first thing is I switch that off. The problem with um, security plugins is they get really excited and want to email you every five minutes about you know the fact the sun's come up. Um, so you really um, you only really want email that's going to be um, relevant to you to to the to to you. So uh, have a look at the notifications and make sure you're only getting sent email that you think is relevant. Um, okay, database backups. We're using another tool for that. File change detection. I've got that switched off because I don't want it scanning my website for changes in files. Local brute force protection. This is what I want um, switched on. Is what that, um, that reduces the ability of a website to try and guess your password. It's called a brute force attack and it's a common way of hacking websites. It's got a local one which has um, tools to protect you on the website level. And then the network one is works like the Google spam system. So if you if a few people in, on Gmail mark something as spam, it'll ban that email across the whole system. So this works a similar way. If you if your website starts blocking certain behaviors of certain websites, it'll block it across the network. So you want to switch this on as well. It's really good protection. Um, SSL. This forces SS, this SSL, which should you should have an SSL, um, which is um, and a free version is Let's Encrypt, um, and that's it up here. And this is forcing everything to use the SSL. Um, so I'm just going to look at system tweaks. Um, so what this is doing is it's stopping public access to various um, files, and those various files will give the hacker information that will help them hack it. So if, if you've got an out of date bit of software, it will maybe listed somewhere and then they can actually specifically um, target it. Disable browser directory means that they can't, if they access stuff, they can't um, look around, obvious reasons. Um, um, so PHP and uploads plugins and themes. So um, this disabled PHP is an active language. So this is what WordPress is coded in. So this is generally the software they're using to hack. So we're just switching that off in that case. I'm trying to keep this simple. So if you want more detail, then I can go through in the um, question and answer. Um, system tweaks, WordPress tweaks, we're switching stuff off. This thing specifically XML RPC. That's a language and sometimes it might break something. So you may have a plugin that's using that. I recommend you switch it off because it is a security risk. However, if you've got a specific plugin that needs it and um, you may need to switch that back on just to test it. Um, same with the rest API. Um, okay. I'm only going through the really relevant. Um, okay. So now I'm going to go to the advanced tab. And this is really a really important one, hide backend. So what this does is with that hacking spam that I talked to you about before, is that they're trying to access the wp-admin and the wp-login.php because they're the main areas where they can cause trouble. So that's what they're targeting the most. What this software will do is it'll actually um, remove those URLs so they don't exist anymore unless you log in. So here I've got an alternative URL, which is manage. So for me to log in, instead of going to wp-admin, I go to forward slash manage, and, that may, and then the uh, admin appears once I'm logged in. So that just really reduces server load from the hacker spam and also makes it a hell, a really harder for them to get in. So that's a really important feature there.
All right, so that's a really uh, quick introduction to a security plugin on what we're doing with it. Um, and again, I just want to really keep this um, quite minimal in that context. Um, I might just jump back to VoltPress and I'm going to look at the pricing. So VoltPress is a, a um, service by um, WordPress, the actual uh, automatic that make WordPress. And this plugs in via the Jetpack um, plugin. So they, this service offers um, backups. Um, so they're, they're doing scans, but they're doing it on their side of this, of the, on their server. So that reduces the um, load on your server. They can restore backups. They, if they find something that they see as a vulnerability, they'll fix it straight away um, and they can download backups. So this is um, a useful tool to um, consider. Okay, so now I'm going to jump to backups and migration. And I'm going to talk in a bit of detail about backups um, because this is really key, um, really important that you've got a backup system. So there was a case um, many years ago when I was um, a younger developer and the host that I had my websites on got hacked and the hackers deleted all the websites. Then the hackers also then hacked into the company's backup servers and deleted all their backups. So what that meant is that if you didn't have independent backups, you had no website gone. Now that hosting company then went out of business pretty quick and they, they literally like left the country and ran away. So at that point, if I had no backup for some sites, we didn't have proper backups. We lost everything. We had to rebuild the sites from scratch. Um, so it's really important that you, if your website's important to you, that you have a backup system in place. And um, so I'm going to assume that your website that you're working on is important and I'm going to run through the system um, and ways of thinking about data and backups and things like that. Um, so it's important that you have your data in three different places. It's a bit of a saying in IT, if you don't have data in three places, it doesn't exist. You also need them in a different place. So if you've got all your backups on the server, and like my example just earlier, if that server gets hacked or something happens to that company, um, then they'll all go. So for example, um, there was a, a file sharing software that was legal. They had um, a lot of legal files on there and they had a lot of illegal pirated content. So the FBI went and confiscated that server. So all the people that had legal files on there, they were using them for scientific backups and all those sort of things. The FBI literally stole their content. So there was court cases around that and it's, it's sort of got to be a mucky. But at the end of the day, if those people, if that was the only place that had their files, then they would have lost all their work. So make sure that, that your files are going to be in multiple places. Okay, so one thing you need to think about is the actual data. So if you've got a big website, say your website's a gig, or which is a massive website in my opinion, or 500 megs, um, 300 megs is sort of a, a normal size website. So each time you do a backup, then your backup's going to be compressed, so maybe 250 megs. If you've got a gig website, so each time you do a backup, that's another gig, another gig. It gets pretty big pretty quick. So you've got to actually manage that data. So the first thing to think of, what, uh, so there's three approaches of what to do with that data that you, you're using as backups. First one is that it's on the same server. So when you run a backup, it runs it to your, your host. So if you've got a five, if you're paying for five gigs data storage and you've got one gig website and two gig email, that only gives you room for another two backups and you've maxed out your hosting. So I recommend you're not leaving your data on there. Um, you may, what I usually do is leave the one recent backup on the server and that's there for when we want to restore. And then we, I, I'll move all the other backups off that site. If your host provides a backup system and they all will, um, they'll usually have that separate there to your actual hosting. So if it's going up to their backup system, you don't really need to worry about that um, in that context. Um, so one way is to just download the backups to your desktop and then you're, you're putting that into your normal backup system. The uh, more, the better way of doing it is you set up an external service such as Amazon Web Server, Google Drive, Dropbox, that sort of thing. So what happens is you run a backup, then you click a button and say send to uh, Google Drive and then it will send it to Google Drive. This means that you're not having to pay for download for your internet um, and you don't have to store them. 
Uh, so that's generally. Um, so AWS is a slightly more complex to set up, but for I'm doing, I've got about 50 website backups up there, multiple backups, and it cost me a dollar a month. So it's really, really cheap to be um, running those backups through that. Okay, so there's a few different approaches to backing up. Um, and one thing that you really want to think about is your server performance. So when your website's doing a backup, it will grab your database and it'll zip it. It'll grab all the files on your website and it'll zip it. Now, compressing files into a zip file is very processor heavy. And you'll notice that when, when you download a zip onto your personal computer, when you unzip it, it takes a, a lot of processing and a bit of time to open that up. So that's just the nature of that technology. So if you run a backup, on your, on your server, it is going to um, take performance and it will probably, in some cases, max out your server. So never run a backup in peak times. Um, you should always be running your backups when your website's not being popular. Um, and there's a few approaches to doing these backups. One is automated. Um, automated backups, daily backups, scheduled backups. Um, and incremental backups. So I'm going to talk about um, automated daily backups. So with my hosting, for example, so I'm with Servosaurus, they do daily automated backups. So that means I don't need to worry about daily backups. So if something, if I want to roll back to a website, uh, to my website yesterday, then I've got them done daily. They keep them for seven days, then they do monthly, then they do weekly ones, they keep them for a couple of weeks, then they do monthly ones. I'm not sure how long they keep them for. Um, but with the daily ones, if I my website got hacked eight days ago, they've been backing up for seven days my hacked website, and then that means that all the backups have, have also hacked websites. They actually know no use to me. Um, so I will also do manual backups. So generally, if I've done any work on the website, so if I've done some work, or I'm about to do some work, um, then I'll do a backup. And that's my manual backup. So that, that I know is clean. Um, and I run, I do that through my backup tool, Backup Buddy. So then I'm running two systems. One is the servers doing automated backups, and then I'm doing specific manual backups. So that means if either system fails, then I've got the other system. Um, and so that, that's what I'd recommend is you have an automated system that's doing daily and all that, but you don't want that on your, um, on your actual WordPress install because it'll hammer your server. Um, I noticed that some people install backup plugins and they'll do automated daily backups, fills their website with data, hurts their processor, and they've already got daily backups up here and they haven't worked on their website for six months. So, I mean, there's no need for those backups. Like there's no changes to the website. Um, except for the updates. So um, just have a think about that. The other um, thing that we do with these tools is called migration. Um, and I won't go through a migration here because um, we've got a lot to go through. But basically, this is if I've got my website at one domain.com and then I want to move it to two domain.com. So that may, may be that your website's changed um, the URL or maybe you're doing a test website. Um, or maybe you're moving servers. So a migration process uh, generally looks like that you'll, you'll um, do a backup, and then there's a script that instead of the WordPress install script, you run this script on the new place. You need a MySQL database, username, password, and permissions. Um, and then, I mean, this information's on the internet, and it's reasonably easy, and then you just follow the prompts and it'll install the WordPress for you. Um, now with your backup restore process, so this is what happens if your website um, has been hacked or there's issues or maybe you've made a mistake and deleted something important. You, there are various ways that you can restore your website. So you need to learn the tools enough to know what they are and ideally do a test. Um, so that way, you know, in an emergency, you know exactly what to do. They're called rollbacks. Um, and generally on the Servosaurus, um, the host website that I'm using. It's simply a button and then you can choose the snapshots. So this is the different times when it was snapped. So you might say, oh, I broke it yesterday afternoon, so I'm gonna roll back to yesterday morning. And then um, it will roll back that back up. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the software. Um, 
that can do this. There's a few tools that I'm recommending to use, depending on what you want to do. Um, share screen. Okay, so Updraft Plus is the most common, uh, is the most used one. Um, they The reason is because they've got a freemium version. So their free version will allow you to do uh, backups, do your scheduled backups, do your manual backups, that sort of thing. Um, if you want to do migration, you'll need to pay a bit. You'll need to pay for a premium version. And if you want to pay for, um, if you want to um, send your website to external, so it's forty-two dollars a year. Um, so this will allow you to then send your um, your data to the external host. So that's um, Google, Dropbox, AWS, that sort of thing. They also this um, service also allows. They've got one gig of, of um, storage that you can send it to their storage space. So if you don't have a Google set up or a, um, a Dropbox, then you can use their system. Um, Backup Buddy is the system that I'm using. Um, this doesn't have a free version, unfortunately, um, but this I found is the was the tool I prefer to use. Um, it allows you to do backups, send it to external sites, and it's got a really good migration tool. Um, and I'll, I'll jump into the backup buddy in a little bit and I'll just give you a quick tour in the back end to show you what that looks like. Um, this is back to WP Manage. Um, the, I recommended this for managing multiple websites. Now in the right hand side here, we've got backups, security. Um, this also does migration. They're um, premium add-ons and they usually charge per site. Um, so I'm using the backup buddy system, not this for that, but this will do it, do that as well. Um, so that's an, another system that you would, uh, that I recommend that you consider. I haven't used it, but, um, I'm using the, um, update system and it's really good. Um, the one that just broke then, I uh, think just closed them was the Jetpack. Um, Jetpack again has a lot of backup, um, with a vault press has, um, uh, actually, we've got it back here. Oh, no. it, um, it has a lot of backup uh, features and that sort of thing. Now, the benefit of using Jetpack and Vault is that then your money, the profits then go into WordPress. So you sort of, it's a way of supporting WordPress. Uh, it's also made by WordPress, the people that make WordPress. So it's pretty, um, pretty rock solid. So all of these tools that I've just mentioned, um, Updraft Plus, Backup Buddy, WP Manage and Jetpack, They'll all do um, backups, they'll do incremental backups, they'll do automated backups, they'll um, send the data off to other sites and they'll do migrations. So these, all these tools will do this. So um, I recommend that you choose one of these tools. Now, if you're just doing simple backups, then Updraft Plus is free. Um, however, I recommend that you set it up so that you've got um, your backups getting sent to an external service. Is there any questions about backups? Um, and security there. Now I've gone, it, it's a very detailed subject. So I'm just trying to, I'm just giving you an overview of that. Um, and I do recommend that you, you, you go into a little bit more detail in your own time. However, if you, um, if that's a bit beyond you, then just grab one of these security plugins. Just have a quick look at the settings. Uh, make sure that you've got your website updated regularly and make sure you got your password. That's generally will be pretty good security. So now I'm going to, talk to you about testing your website and this is optimizing it for various speed and things like that. Now it's really important that when you've got a website that you regularly test your user journey. And what I mean by that, we've, we've went through user journey in the, in earlier webinars when we we're talking about strategy, but for example, user journey could be um, someone donates. So you want to make sure that they've that the links to the donate work. So you click on the link. There could be human error or something could have broken. Go to your donate page. Actually fill in your credit card. Donate. Test that that then test that that goes into your bank. You want to um, if you're getting regular donations, you don't need to test it because it's being tested. You know it's coming in. But if you get sporadic uh, donations, then you'll need to test it regularly, and you definitely test it before you go live. Also with your donation or if you're running some sort of shop or products, what you can do is you donate to it and then also go through the process of issuing a refund. Because if somebody um, contacts you and says, oh, I made a mistake with the donation, I don't want to donate, 
can I have my money back? At that point, it's not good for anybody to argue. It's just better to give their money back. So in that case, you can then, you can, you'll know what to do. So whatever your um, billing software, whether that's Stripe or PayPal, you can then learn on how to issue a refund and do all that sort of stuff. Um, so if that case, if that happens in real life, then you know how to do that. You want to make sure that you test your signups, um, your email forms, and any important links. There's been many, many a case where an important link, say to the buy now button, is not working correctly, and um, obviously you've just lost an amazing uh, an opportunity um, for the whole point of what your website is. Okay, so I'm going to talk about cross browser and device testing. So in the old days, we used to test on Internet Explorer and Netscape on two size monitors. So uh, times have changed since then. We've now got thousands of monitor, we've got mon thousands of devices, monitor sizes, we've got multiple browsers. Um, we have a plethora of um, applications we test for. So I'm just gonna run through that a bit. So the first thing is if you're, how much customization are you doing? So in the old, in previous um, phases of my career, we were, Right, or custom writing themes. So we're writing all the code to run the website. So that means that we would need to extensively test um, what that code was doing across um, browsers. Things would always break in Internet Explorer, for example, because it was just a really awful browser. So we need to do regular testing. Now that I am using Divi for my main um, website development, what Divi's extensively tested across heaps of platforms. It's got a massive user base. So there's heaps of people that if there's a bug on a various application, then they'll feed back to Divi and it'll get fixed in theory. So that means I'm pretty confident that out of the box that that Divi is, is pretty robust. So in that context, I'm not testing it. Um, if I was about to release a very big website or one that was um, costing lots of money, then I would do some testing. But generally for the fact that it has already been tested. So that depends what you're doing with it. And now if you just are using default Divi approaches and you're, you're not doing anything too custom, then in that case, it's, it's highly likely that it's going to be okay. Um, if you're doing some heavy customizations of that theme, then you want to test it. So I just want to um, jump to browser stats and just show you um, that. If I jump to... Okay, so this um, is the browser stats. Since 2002, they've been doing the statistics on what browsers have been using from 50 uh, million monthly visits. So W3 schools, um, I know I referenced um, this site a lot of my webinars when I was talking about the basics. If you want to learn HTML and CSS, it's a good place to come. So, um, so in 2020, 80.7% of people were using the Chrome browser. Now that's good because it's not Microsoft, which is now down to 3.7. Microsoft used to have market share, um, but they had such bad technology that everyone's just really happy that um, Microsoft doesn't get used because it's just awful. Um, but what's really um, sad about that is now that um, Google has 80.7% of everyone that views the internet. Um, so that's quite scary that such a powerful corporation has that much control. Um, Firefox, which is open source, is um, only 8.6%. And then Safari, which is based on Firefox, is the Mac version. So we can really, what we want to do is we want to test for Chrome um, and Firefox. This also has lots of other, um, so you can test for your browser statistics. Um, so what operating systems, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can come here and actually, so generally if I'm doing commercial testing, I'll only test for the most common browsers and most common devices, unless the client wants to pay me extra to do more extensive testing. Um, Cause the idea is if it works on the basic browsers, that's most people, and it's then likely to work on the other browsers anyway. Um, but if it's important to you, then you know we'll pay a bit more to do that. Um, I think it's just good practice that everyone in your, on your team um, checks it. Check it on mobile, check it on desktop, get your people in your organization to just play with the website. Just check for things because different people will click on different things, they'll look for different things. And um, so for example, I had a client and um, they agreed to do the user testing, 
And then they contacted me saying their shop on a mobile, the checkout button was broken. So that meant that anyone on a mobile phone couldn't use their web shop. Now that's because they'd asked for customizations, um, which then led to it being broken on mobile. But because they didn't test it, they had when they had agreed to test it, then um, their main main thing was broken. Um, so in that case, we we banned them from testing now. So I'll take over their testing in the future. But um, it also shows the importance that you need to test things. Um, don't trust your page editors either. So in Divi, for example, it'll show you what it looks like on a mobile or show you what it looks like on a tablet. Just take that as a loose guide. You need to test it on a mobile. You need to actually test it on a tablet. So in the old days, I talked about when we had a few platforms, web companies actually would set up PCs, Macs, and all the different versions of browsers and, and they'd have phones plugged in and they'd, they'd manually look at it. Now that we've got so many devices, that's just not really possible and it's just not very smart. So what we do is we will hire a company such as Browser Stack or Cross Browser Testing. So what Cross Browser Testing does is they actually have 1500 browsers set up. They're probably emulators in a lot of ways, but they they actually have all these different variants, all the different versions of Chrome, different versions of Firefox, different versions of Android, different versions of Mac, all the things. And then you can log in and then you can test your website on 1500 setups. Um, the one way that they do is they'll do screenshots so, you, so you, you can visually see and then you can also log in and actually interact with your website. So this is definitely the most cost effective way of doing your testing. Um, they have different prices, some are free. Um, but if you're doing major testing of a website, they're probably about $30 a month. So you can jump in and do, do your testing. So I really recommend that um, you use one of those testings, those systems. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about accessibility testing. And this accessibility testing, is pretty much ignored by most web companies. And I think that that's um, really, um, just incompetent and unprofessional. Um, but for us activists and us people trying to make the world better, I really ask the question like, will the revolution or evolution, will it include everyone? And I think it's really important that we make a website um, and a world that's inclusive for all. So I think it's just um, part of uh, what we should be doing is doing um, in accessibility testing. Some other reasons to do the accessibility testing is the Actually, I'll just stop the share. Um, is the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992 in Australia's law. So that means that you can actually be sued if your website's not accessible. That's highly unlikely. The cases that have been sued were the Olympic Games website. Um, however, that was more, that would have been a more of a symbolic target because it's high, high profile, um, just to bring, you know, bring more awareness of that. Um, now, in saying that though, um, all government agencies are required to meet WCAG 2.0 um, standards. So that means if you're building a government website, it has to um, meet standards. And that is, is a common sense because everybody, every Australian should um, be able to access an Australian government website. Um, so I would also extend that any um, council, um, any anything that's um, that's relevant in that in that governing concept should be accessible. So I also would say that your website should be accessible um, for the same reasons. If it's important enough for an able-bodied people a person, then it should be uh, important enough for uh, um, people with various disabilities. But if that hasn't sold you, then I'm going to then jump back to search marketing and search optimization. When you optimize for people with disabilities, you're optimizing it for robots. Um, not saying the, the, the disability people are robots, but it's using the same um, technology and same, same approach. So you're actually making the website far better for Google and Google will reward you for that. Um, and also voice control, which is new technology coming out. So for example, someone's reading, driving their car and they go, hey Google, can you read me this web page about um, your charity? And then Google starts reading that web page for them um, and they're navigating the website via voice. 
this is a technology that's available and being used now. So again, um, that technology was in part enabled by screen reader technology that was developed by people for people with sight impairment. So that pretty much grabbed the whole technology and then adapted it this way. So um, by making it uh, accessible for that, you're making accessible this. All right, so this is the reason why we want to do it. And I'm just going to give you a basic intro, the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. I'm not going to click on that link, that's in the run sheet, and I'm not going to uh, talk in detail. It's going to get very neat, nerdy and detailed from here on in. However, um, the W3C is the organization that manages web protocol. So all of the rules around the internet, how things work. So if you talk about, if we go back to the um, Web Tech Basics webinar, they're the, they're the organization that made up all those rules. The Web Accessibility Initiative is um, a subset of that. So it's a project of that organization because web accessibility is really important and that organization has a, a, a whole um, section devoted to it and, um, and tools and things like that. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, making things accessible um, for certification, so if we're talking about getting it to standard, it's actually quite complex. Um, so what, I'm, what I want to go through instead today is just the basics that everyone should think about. So I, I may skip over some, some details, but I think um, the things I'm going to run through are the basics that everyone should do. So let me just share screen and I'm going to just run through um, some of the basics um, that you should be looking at. So the first thing is writing cement. Uh, so for people with no vision, so I've sort of divided it up here between three three um, groups: no vision, vision impaired, and hand, and low hand coordination. So first thing is is to write quality semantic code. Now in my search optimization webinar, I talked in detail about semantic code. So um, I'm going to skip that bit, and you can refer to that that webinar that's on YouTube. Um, semantic code is basically writing um, writing your your code to be correct um, in a in a technical way. Um, now it's interesting that's in the search optimization webinar because, as I mentioned before, the screen readers and Google read the website the same way. So therefore, by optimizing for Google, you're actually optimizing for people with disability. So uh, Google has has actually really increased the standard of the internet. Um, by forcing websites to use proper standards. Okay, so descriptive links. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, I'm not sh sharing the screen, I should be screwing. There you go. So, um, descriptive links. So I want you to look at these two links here. So screen readers do two things. They'll read, read out the links and they'll also sometimes put the links somewhere else. So they may put the links at the top of the page so the person can go, I don't want to read the website. I just want to know what links are on there. Um, so I want you to look at this one. This one says click here. So imagine if, if all the links were at the top of the page and then the screen reader is saying click here, click here, click here, click here. Doesn't make sense, right? So if you look at the next link, I've actually written more information on action skills. So that means the screen reader will literally read more information on action skills. That makes sense. So make sure that every single link that you make from now on forever is descriptive and makes sense by itself. Okay, so no more clicking here, no more buy here. Your link should say click, if you want to say click here, that's fine, but you'd say click here for more information on action skills. Now in saying that though, if you're saying click here, then that probably means you got bad design because you should make all your links obvious that they're links um, so you shouldn't need to write, you know, say click here. I mean, people are on the internet, they know how to click on something. You don't need to tell them. It's very um, patronizing to even say click here. What you want is you want good descriptive links. You need to put descriptions on your alt text. And again, I went through that in detail in the search optimization webinar and also the um, optimizing images webinar. Um, basically, that's the text that loads when images don't. Um, and also used by screen readers to describe what the image is. Very important. Okay, so whatever you do from now on, start um, implementing those um, small things. Okay, so the next section is for somebody who is not using a screen reader, they're just using the website. This would probably come in, if you just think of some elderly people who have 
the you know, the site's going. So you're not really looking at a major disability, but you know, enough for you to be taken seriously. So in this case, some basic um, graphic design comes into play. The size of your fonts, um, make them reasonably big. Contrast, um, that means that it's easier to read, easier to read. High, so high, you need high contrast. Everything that you um, do should be high contrast. And remember that if you're putting, um, if you're putting um, uh, cut like white on blue, if like up the top here, then you want to make sure that it, it really stands out. By putting um, light colors on dark backgrounds makes it harder to read. So you want to really make sure you got that contrast. And I'll show you a contrast tester in a little bit. Um, you want enough space around things. So if you're if you're if it's hard to read and you've got everything blocked up and everything squished in, it makes it harder to read again. So make sure you've got enough space around things. You want to have obvious links. So um, my website's um, rapid prototyping. So one thing I need to do is actually make these links more obvious. They look like links at the moment, but I think that they should be even more obvious. Now, if you're um, not sure or your your design allows it then you should make your default links blue that are underlined. So my color is blue, so that totally makes sense. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come here and when I next work on website, I'm gonna make all my links blue underlined. That is the default um, standard. So when in doubt, try to use default standard. So that's blue underlined. Um, now, when someone clicks on a link, it now becomes a visited link. So that tells someone that I've clicked on that link and I've been to that page, I don't need to go there again. So that's pretty useful when you've got a list, list of links. So in that case, the default color is purple and underlined. So if your graphic design won't suit that, um, say your color palette, it will look a bit weird. So um, you can use different colors. Try to use underlines if possible, because it shows it's a link. Um, and, but make sure it's obvious that it's a link. Um, never underline text that isn't a link, because underline, on an internet web page means it's a link. So if you've got some text underlined, somebody will be clicking on it and they'll be like, why, why isn't this working? Um, you know, and it will look like it's a broken link when you've just underlined some text. So you're not allowed to underline text anymore unless it's a link. Um, also image map. So an image map um, is where an image is clickable. So in this case, um, my logo at the top here is, is clickable. So you want to make sure that it's um, it's obvious that it can be clickable. I mean, this is a logo, so that's a internet standard. But sometimes you might have an image like a map that's got um, various uh, hotspots where you can click. Make sure that those spaces um, work as a link. Um, so make sure that the whole space that you want to be clickable is clickable and those sort of things. And um, so coming from a graphic design background and then working in code, a uh, big issue working with graphic designers is their cool design. So for example, low contrast looks cool as a general vibe. Um, so if you're doing a print design poster, you're printing a poster, doing really subtle low contrast design looks cool. Now, if you use default um, website um, protocol and design, it will look pretty ugly because the default website design is ugly. So um, your designers uh, may send you unaccessible artwork and this happens all the time. So therefore I need to then test it and I'll send their color scheme back and go, you failed the test, send me another color palette. Um, and then it gets um, a bit of a to and fro until they work out how to make a color palette that's actually accessible, which is quite different to a cool, so a good designer can make something that looks nice, that's accessible. So if they're saying we can't make it accessible, it's not going to look nice, then you say, well, you're not a very good designer, try a bit harder. Okay, and the other thing I'll um, think about is um, hand eye coordination. So um, grab your mouse on your left hand and navigate with your mouse. Um, so in that case, someone with a, ha a low hand coordination may not um, have a major disability, but just a little bit uncoordinated. So if you Think about the drop down menus. Um, hang on, I'll just stop share. So, if you think about the drop down menus, if you've ever seen them where you, you drop down and then halfway there's another thing that drops down and then it drops down, how are you going to use one of that, that menu with your left hand or if you're, if you're less dominant hand? 
that's going to be impossible. So for someone who has a low hand coordination, they're not going to be able to navigate your website. So you want to make sure that things are just um, easy to click on. Uh, if you, I recommend not using drop downs, but if you need to use drop downs, make sure that they're they're big and they're easy to sort of plob your hand around and like. Um, so you really want to make it in that context. Um, the link surface area. So what I mean by that is that if you've got a, a link, you want to actually make this like the clickable bit large. Um, this is also on a mobile because people have, some people have big fingers. Um, so, you're, so that's more for image based things um, and shortcuts. So for example, if you're filling out a web form, the tab key will actually shoot you to the next. So you fill out the first um, field, you hit tab, we'll go to the next one, and next one, next one. So you wanna make sure that your um, website doesn't um, turn that off. And, um, and if you actually want to go to the next level, you would actually program various, you'd learn what the standard uh, shortcuts are in a website and then you would apply them. If you're using an off the shelf theme, um, you may look for them to have that coded in. And there's, I've just got on the run sheet more detail. So there's Guru99 and software testing help. That goes into a lot more detail about the various things, thinking about accessibility and, um, and um, how to add that to your website. I'm going to jump into some testing tools. Um, and so I recommend, I recommend spending a bit of time actually doing some testing and reviewing your website because once you've learned it, this stuff's reasonably easy. It's, it's complex when you, you're learning it, but once you learn it, it's, it's pretty easy. Same as search engine optimization, right? So I recommend that you learn it because then you'll just do it as part of your website build and then you're just automatically making your websites more accessible and making the world much more inclusive. Okay, so uh, so say you're getting, um, you wanted to be audited for certification. So you're, you're building a government website. Um, so in that case, it needs to be manually certified. So if you search for accessibility testing, um, there's a few companies in Australia that provide that. Um, most of them provide jobs for people with disabilities. So that's really good. Um, generally, they're quite expensive services, um, but the cost is coming down. The one of the big drawbacks for um, the certification that I see is that they certify every page, um, and then if you change the page, then it's no longer certified. So in that context, um, I generally will look at testing the themes and the structure, and then teaching my teams how to actually do accessible, adding the content. So that way, um, you may miss uh, a bit here and there, but your the far lower cost um, to provide accessibility, um, which is better than some people that say, let's skip accessibility till it's too expensive. I'd rather say, well, let's, let's, let's get it to 90% at least, which shouldn't be any extra cost or any extra work. Let, let's at least do that rather than ignoring it. Um, the worst thing you can possibly do is just ignore the issue at all. So this is um, oh yeah, a bit more information about accessibility. This is the laws in Australia and some important documentations. This is linked on the run sheet you can come back to. Okay, so this is the WAVE tool. So let's jump to um, action skills. Now remember this is just a robot, so um, nothing beats manual testing, but this really will help you learn. Okay, so while that's loading, I'll just jump to this one. So what this is, is this is a contrast checker. So this will put two colors, foreground and background color, and it'll give you a pass. So if you're working with a graphic designer or if you're doing your own color palettes, you can come here and put in your colors and it will tell you whether it's um, accessible or not. You can also, uh, okay, so it's got for normal size text and for larger text. So for example, if I put, um, white on white, it's obvious that that's going to, so that's going to fail. Um, so if you've, I'm just going to randomly, now the problem is it's using hex codes. So in that context, you would need to um, use a, a text hex editor. So photo, Photoshop, um, so this hex is the color schemes that websites use. So the color protocol. So you'll need to use a software that can do that. 
Um, and if I just go for um, hex color picker, spelled American color. Then we've got all the colors here. So, um, so if you don't, if you don't have Photoshop or something like that, you can use a tool like this. So then we can put in the color here. So that this will make us orange on. And so it's failed. So it's passed one test. So WCAG AA is a um, easier test. So there's two, two different levels of certification. So we've only just passed that. So that's actually not very accessible. So that's how you use that tool, which is great for doing your color schemes. Now I'll jump back to here. We've got zero errors, 12 alerts. Um, now structural elements are things that make it easier to navigate. So for example, we've got a proper menu system here. Um, so if you've got any errors, you need to fix them. Um, so divvy out of the box is pretty good. Um, so this is an automated tool that will help you. Now, if you um, jump to some of the links that I've sent through, that I've got on the run sheet, um, there's heaps of other links for lots of other tools and lots of things like that. Well, I just really wanted to just um, introduce you the concept um, so that you can start looking into that. Now we're going to talk about going faster. I won't go faster, but we'll talk about faster, faster, faster. So um, for speeding up websites is key um, for many reasons. Simply one main reason is simply to make your website faster um, for the user because uh, who likes going to a slow website? Slow websites suck, right? So you want to make a fast website for your user. You also want to increase um, the user's pathway goal success. So in that case, if your whole point of your website is to get somebody to book for an event, then each step that's slow means there's going to be more drop off. So the faster that your website is, the more likely that they will achieve the goal that you want. So whether that's donate or whatever. So if you've got a donate page, it's really slow to load, then you'll get a drop off of donation. Someone goes, yeah, I want to donate. Yeah, I don't have patience for this. Or okay, it's taken so long to load. Do I trust this website? Um, it's also your brand reputation as well. So if uh, you've got a slow, dodgy website, people just subconsciously start thinking about that um, of the product. So I've got a client that's running a health food, um, sells health food products, and um, they refuse to update their, upgrade their hosting. So their website's always slow. And it just makes that, that product just seems a little bit like not, not great. Um, some people have slow internet. Um, especially in rural Australia, um, there's black spots in Melbourne. So a lot of Melbourne CBD, for example, have slow internet. Um, so in that case, you want your website to work on um, slow internet connections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also people have mobile um, experiences. So again, you want your website to load fast on a mobile and search rank. So now Google is actively prioritizing fast websites. So that means if your website's slow, you're going to get de-ranked in competitive search keywords. So if uh, you're trying to get number one on Google for a search keyword, you need to speed up your website. So that's the reasons why we're going to do it. So some of the things which will um, make your website slow will affect the speed of your website. Um, so you've got the website theme and code. So that's the software you're running uh, and also the, the theme at the front of your WordPress. So specifically um, how well that's written um, and the size of media. So that is how big your images are. That's how big your fonts, like fonts take a lot of space up generally. Um, things like your CSS and things like that. So the size of the media. Also the number of files. So if you've, so browsers will restrict and servers restrict the max, uh, maximum number, not browsers, sorry, servers are restricted, the maximum number of um, items that can be served at once. So if you've got a large amount of files, so maybe the, there's 50 tiny images, they will actually, um, they'll be limited. So only a few will load, then a few will load, then a few will load. Um, server processes. So uh, again, we talked about this in the um, web tech um, webinar about servers and how they work. But basically, if you think about it like your computer, if you're running too much software at once, it will slow it down. So if your software is badly written or is inefficient for some other reasons, 
then it will slow down your website. If it's scanning, it will slow down your website. So for example, doing a virus scan or um, checking to see if files have changed, that sort of thing. Uh, if it's running a backup, then it will um, impact your server process. There's a system called Cron. Um, this is which uh, WordPress uses to do various processes and updates. Uh, that's a little complex, so I won't run through that on this webinar. Uh, and also updates. Obviously, if you're updating your website, WordPress sometimes will shut your website down for a couple minutes, for a couple seconds, um, while it updates. So obviously, that will slow your website down. Um, hosting is one of the big things that affects the speed. Um, so again, I went through that in the um, basics of website tech. So I recommend um, having a look at that ab about hosting and how to get a host that's actually fast and will serve your purposes. The other um, technologies that we'll be looking at that will speed your website up is caching and CDN. So I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So I won't discuss that. So now I'm just going to talk about actually testing your website for speed, which I think is essential to be doing um, for any website. So. Now, Action Skills doesn't have any images, so it's not really worth doing. So, what I did is I previously, it took a while to load, is I um, tested this website. Uh, actually, device, and it's going to load slow. Okay. So, this is uh, actually, if I jump back to here, there's there's heaps of um, software tools that will allow you to test your website. Um, GT Metrics and webpagetest.org is. Um, two that I recommend, but there are other tools. So this uh, one that we're looking at here is web page test. And uh, so what I have here is 11 seconds to load my website. And it's got a few details. Um, so I'm just going to, and you'll have a look. This also, when I hit to actually test for it, I've actually selected Sydney because my website's located in Melbourne and Sydney was the closest place. So you also want to test as close as you can to your host because then you're actually testing the website itself, not the hosting. And now it's run, it's done two, three runs. So that's interesting. One of them did 6.5 seconds, one did 7.8 seconds, and one did 11 seconds. So that's interesting, there's a bit of variance. So that's why it does three tests. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna click on what we call the waterfall. I'm just going to go through and, and teach you how to read this read this thing because if you're looking at it really quickly, it looks really quite complex, but I'll break it down and it's not actually that complex. Okay, so at the top, we've got um, some um, like the code, so HTML. Now, things like DNS, um, you can't speed that up. Um, or SSL, well, you need SSL. So, that's, so the things we're looking at is HTML, J JavaScript, I'm at the top here, CSS, images, fonts. So if I'm looking at this um, graph here, the most of this load time is HTML. So my web page, all the code. So that's Divi putting in a lot of code bloat. Um, so my actual text on my page, that's massive. Um, and you can also um, roll over it and it'll come up with that screen, which will give you more detail. So if I click on that, who actually say uh, how long the talk, how big the detail is, that sort of thing. So now if I'm looking at um, this, this picture, the next big thing I'm looking at is the purple. Okay, so orange. Now specifically this one here. So this is saying that unsplash3.jpg and that is, um, how big is this? It's saying it's 58.1 kilobytes and it took a long time to load. Now, if I have a look at the device website, that is this massive image in this background here. Uh, this huge beach one. Now, I've made a decision that I'm going to bring in a big image for the graphic design. So that's a decision I'm making, and this is the impact that I'm having here. Um, now, this is an optimized site, so sometimes maybe not a good example. But for example, here's the other images I can see here, and we can see what they are. Okay, so these red ones. Now you'll notice that we've got all these fonts. Now the first thing that I'll be doing to optimize this would be to reduce the amount of fonts. What we've got here, if I have a look, we've got, um, if I close that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Why am I loading in eight fonts? I should have one font for titles and I should have one font for um, my body copy maximum. So I've got six fonts here. 
that are, um, shouldn't be used and they're um, really eating my download time. Um, and then um, we've got Java, some JavaScript here and bits and pieces. So that's how, how to read the website test. So in that context, um, you're really looking for the big things and then things that you can actually adjust. So this is, for example, the, um, the image. Okay, now, let me just scroll down. Um, now I'm going to talk about caching and to introduce caching and what that is, I'm just going to now jump to the website. I switched the, the cache off for this one. Now I'm going to jump to the website that is cached. And look at that, 4.5 seconds of four seconds. And then I've got 4.2 4 seconds and then 11 seconds. So what happened is I started running the test and we got four seconds. And then what I did is I switched off the cache because I wanted to show you um, the difference. So we're looking here, my cache is actually taking seven seconds. It's, it's cutting my website to a third. So that is the difference between a cache is it's going to make my website a third faster. So that should obviously show you the lesson how important a cache is. And so I'll talk to you about caching um, in a bit more detail, but let's just have a look at the graph that's different now that we've got it cached. And you'll see that this blue um, section, which is the text is far smaller. So it's, it's compressed it. You'll see that there's less files as well. If I jump to this picture, uh, there's 33 files there. Oh no, there's still 33, sorry. Um, this big image is still a big image causing issues. Um, so yeah, so you can, and again, the way that I'd speed this website up is I'd take out some fonts and then I'd be looking at these images. So now it's cached. The big issues now is simply the images and the fonts. All right. So we I again talked about caching in the basics of WordPress tech. And um, so I'll just run that through a, a little bit again. So basically when WordPress um, displays a page, uh, the browser goes to index.php and then index goes, oh, let's load in um, some basic WordPress stuff. And oh, I've got to talk to the database. And then the database says, oh yeah, start loading this stuff and that stuff. And then it says, oh, but you've got these plugins installed so start loading them. And then the plugins go, but we need to get some data from the database. So it goes to the database to pull some data. And then um, the software goes, oh, we need to get the theme. So then it'll grab the theme. Then it'll grab the content from the database and it'll build your web page. Now it's a little bit more technical than that, obviously, but if you just think of it like it's doing stuff, um, that's doing stuff live. Each time you load a page, it's building it, um, building the pages. And, um, so if you've got uh, a lot of traffic, if you've got a thousand people viewing that same page at once, it's building that page a thousand times. So that doesn't make sense. So what, what a cache is, is it makes a copy of the page. It grabs the final page that's been built and it makes a copy of it. Then it just serves that, that page. So that means the page isn't getting built. So that will then reduce the server time quite substantially. So that's technically what a cache does. Um, however, caching technology will do additional things as well, which technically isn't called caching, but um, it's part of the process. And that is optimizing and compressing and combining files. So in the case of my device website, um, it compressed the HTML and, all, and the, the scripts and the files and made them um, smaller. Um, it does that by taking out all the spaces um, most of most of the size of it is, is things like spaces and other characters that aren't being used. Uh, also, it um, combines files. So when I mentioned before that there's a limit to how many files um, a server can load at once. So if you've got say six JavaScripts from different plugins and you combine them to be one script, then that means that it's going to load a lot faster because then it's got time to load other things at the same time. So as well as um, printing a page, uh, as well as displaying a page that's already 
produced. It will also um, compress things, it will combine things, and it will do various optimization. I'm going to run you through um, the settings of a caching plugin because they can get complex. Just so that um, you can start looking at some of the things that it's doing. Okay, so the, there's a few approaches to caching. And caching is used throughout um, software. So uh, Facebook, for example, will you cache your, um, your page if you share it on Facebook, then it'll take a copy of that. And then next time someone shares your page, it'll, it'll share the, the cached version. So there's a few ways of approaching a cache in a WordPress context. The first way is the WordPress side. And what that will do is that will, um, that will be the initial grabbing the copy um, and it'll also do some of the compression compression stuff. Uh, another approach is a server side approach. So this means that the caching is happening on your host's host server. And there's various technologies that, that do that. And for example, some of your specialized WordPress hosting environments, such as Kinster and Mani uh, um, WP Engine, they uh, invest in advanced technologies and caching technologies to make your website faster. And so they can, they can um, market themselves as being fast service because they've got really um, really good caching technologies. That's out of your hands. So in that case, you may choose a web host that has good server side um, caching. Now caching works better on a server side than on the WordPress side. So, so generally you'd only um, do your caching, well generally you'll do both. So you, you do your caching on WordPress um, side and then you also will cache it on the server side. Um, so that's the, the better way of doing it. Um, if you've got no access to server technologies, then you'll just need to um, uh, host it on the WordPress side. Um, one technology that I'm um, that I've been I did a lot of uh, research on this actually um, a couple of months ago, um, and I just run through that research that I did with you. Um, specifically, a technology called Lightspeed. Um, so Lightspeed is both a server side technology and a WordPress side technology. Um, um, this is the fastest that I've found um, by far. So I was um, testing all the WordPress plugins, um, testing all the caches. Um, then I was testing Lightspeed and it was significantly faster. That's because it's using a combination and a very sophisticated combination between WordPress caching and optimization and server level caching. Another way that you can um, do your um, caching is what we call an external cache. So this is a company like Cloudflare. So what Cloudflare does is that they, um, they're hosted somewhere else and you send your DNS, so you delegate your domain to Cloudflare. So the, the traffic actually goes to Cloudflare and then they go to your server and take a copy of your website and then serve it from their server. There's a few benefits of that. One is that they've got, um, is really good for security. So when we were talking about security earlier, if you put your website on Cloudflare, that means that hackers have to hack Cloudflare, not your server. Well, they have to hack Cloudflare before even knowing where your website is. Uh, and Cloudflare is a big, massive um, company. So um, they've, they've got super security. So um, that's a good, good way to help security. Um, as far as the caching side of the technology, they basically have servers all over the world. And so that means that they can then serve your website locally. So for example, my website's hosted in Melbourne. So if I've got Cloudflare set up and someone visits from London, it will actually serve from Cloudflare's London um, data center. So they're, only, they're not coming to Melbourne, they're coming from London. And if they um, view it in St. Petersburg, then it'll come from Russia. And if they view it in America, it will come from America. So that technology allows actual geographic uh, location as well as caching. So that's another way to optimize your website. Now the problem in Australia is we have a monopoly called Telstra and Telstra aren't very good at business and they're very greedy. And so, um, they charge large data um, fees. So in the context of Cloudflare, their free version, they um, negotiated with all the service providers, all the internet companies around the world, and the internet companies gave them a discount um, to run free traffic through their systems. Because the bigger picture is that Cloudflare in increases security of the internet. 
So the internet providers are like, that's good. Your free service will give you a discount on data and then you can offer it free for customers and um, the internet's a safer place and everyone's happy, uh, safer and faster. But Telstra, um, they, won't, they would not negotiate. So therefore Cloudflare doesn't serve through Australia. So if you've got a free version of Cloudflare, it will actually come from Hong Kong or somewhere like that. So it actually, in Australian context, doesn't speed your website up in the geographic sense. Um, that's just a bummer about Telstra. Um, but still, um, in some cases, uh, for the security, um, and if you're a global website, then Cloudflare is still a um, good option. Um, now, if I jump back to the run sheet, I did some research um, uh, on the third um, for a client. And I researched, uh, I spent quite a lot of time researching all the caching. I reviewed the caches, I installed them and did some stuff. So here's a summary of my research. I'll, I'll, I'll let you do it in your own time, but here's a, um, a blog that um, tested, tested um, caches. Um, I actually did the speed tests and, and did extensive testing of all these different caches. So this one recommended Cache Enabler. Um, now, that actual tool, Cache Enabler, um, is making, they, they're selling CDN services. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. So they sell CDN services, so they're making a really good cache for free so that you would upsell to their CDN service. Um, I looked, I researched CDNs as well, and they offer a good pricing model as well. So in that case, um, that could be a good option to look at for optimizing. Uh, the next one down, they uh, recommended Hummingbird. Now Hummingbird is a plugin by um, WPMUDev. I find that company very spammy. You install one plugin and then they put ads through the back end of your website. Um, you need to pay for a um, premium uh, membership to their website, that sort of thing. However, their um, cache looks is fast from testing. The other one that we looked at was um, on this test here was WP Rocket. Um, this is a paid plugin. So if you were wanting to pay for your, um, your cache, then you could consider that. Now the one I was using before that is WP Fastest Cache. The reason I like this one is simply because it's fast and it's, it's simply um, easy, right? So I had a few issues with caching and I'm going to show you in a little bit, like caching can get quite complex and it can break things. So um, this sort of breaks less things and it's just simpler to use. They have a freemium model. So the free version is a certain cost and then the paid version um, costs a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I also recommend fastest cache as well. And in the speed test, it did okay in the performance side of things. So now I'm going to jump um, under the bonnet to, um, I did have this open, but I'll jump. So light speed cache. And um, if this will load. Um, so this needs to be enabled on the server side. So that means your host will need to have light speed installed. So that's two. Um, parts of the technology one is on the server the other is here and so i'm just going to run you through some of the things uh, okay so i've switched it off so i did that when i was doing that testing um the web speed testing so i could uh, show you okay so let's turn that on save changes Okay, now I'm going to jump to the cache. All right, so there's, there's heaps of settings in here and I'm just going to run you through some of them so you can um, get an idea. So first you want the cache switched on. Now do we want to cache um, front end, or do we want to cache um, people who are logged in? Um, if you're developing a website and you're working on the website, you don't want it cached because it's, it's going to um, be annoying because each time you save something, you're going to have to clear the cache. Now in saying that though, it's also good because if you forget to clear the cache, 
and you've updated a website, then the old version is live. Because remember, you've made a copy of the web page. That's what a cache is. So sometimes it's good or bad to have the cache for logged in users. Um, so that'd be up to you. Um, okay, now I'm going to, oh, and also we've got purge. So what purge does is it, um, it clears the cache. So it's important that if you've got any problems with your website, if you've got anything a little bit buggy or something's not loading quite right, or if you've updated your website, come and clear the cache. Clearing the cache is never going to break your website because all you're doing is deleting the copy and you're forcing the software to make another copy. Um, so you can purge here. Now up here at the top here is you've got um, purge all and purge the um, JavaScript and CSS. If you're not sure which to do, then purge all. Um, that will just clear all your caches. Um, I recommend having browser caching switched off. What browser caching does is it keeps a copy of your website in the user's browser. So that means that if you make a change to your website, you can't flush it. You can't flush the cache because it's in, in someone else's browser. So, um, and in this case, it's saying uh, four weeks and two days. So if you've updated your website, their, web, their, their version of it's not gonna update for four weeks and two days. So that's great if you never update your website. Um, I just find that risky and I'll always have browser caching switched off. Um, but what it will do is it'll speed up your website significantly because they're not even downloading the website. They've already got it loaded on their desktop um, and it'll just load in straight away. Um, this advanced tab, this is um, really scary, but this is where the, um, the speed happens, a lot of the speed optimization. So I'm gonna run through the advanced tab. Now remember, caches can break things. So when you're playing with a cache, make sure you're testing the website. It's, and then if it's something's broken, then come and switch some things off and on. Um, oh, actually, this isn't where it is. It should be, uh, sorry, it's in the page optimization. So let me jump to page optimization. Okay, so page optimization, um, when I showed you the speed test, there was um, the caching which makes a copy, but additionally, we wanna actually optimize the, um, the actual files and everything that's coming off the server. CSS minify, what this does is it grabs your CSS and it shrinks it, it compresses it. Um, so that's useful having on. Um, CS combine, which um, merges them. So most plugins, some themes will have multiple CSS files. So you might have, you know, six, 10 CSS files. And so if you combine them, there's less files downloading and so it gets um, a lot quicker. Um, having that switched on, when you combine files, can sometimes break things. So um, just bear that in mind. Um, um, same with the JavaScript, you want to minify and combine it. Now I've got a, I've had a case on my websites where um, combining the JavaScript is breaking the contact form. So I definitely want to then switch that back off until I can isolate that. So the way to um, then still use JS combine is to actually find the script and exclude it. That may be a bit complicated. So in which case you'll just have to switch it off. So what that just means is it's 99% optimized rather than hundred, which is, it's better that your website actually works. So if you're not really understanding the stuff that I'm doing, then um, in that context, if it breaks it, just switch it off. It's better to be off and your website works. Um, optimization settings. Okay, minify HTML. So that's squishing your the actual main web page. So if we jump to this device here, this blue line, this is the HTML. This is um, after caching and this is before caching. So you can really see it's, um, that's had a huge impact on the page speed. Um, now I've got to find where I was now. Uh, apologies, I've lost my tab. Too many tabs. Oh, here we go. 
Apologies. Um, now, inline CSS and in, inline JS is um, scripts that are actually inside the HTML page. Again, I've got all that compressing. Um, anything else that we want? Okay, remove Google fonts. Remove Google. Um, so in that context, um, some themes and plugins will be loading Google fonts. So in, in the case that I showed you, I've got a lot of fonts loading in. So I need to audit those fonts. And so I'll probably use another method of blocking those Google fonts, but you may use this one here. Um, now, remove the WordPress emoji. So WordPress, uh, in a recent update, um, added a whole emoji library. Now, if your website doesn't use emoji, it actually will load in all these scripts to support that. So generally, we just switch off the emoji. It's just a waste of load speed, and I recommend not having it. Um, okay, so that's the, the basic settings. And as you can see, it's even more, um, more detailed than this. But what I wanted to show you is more as a beginner. So here's the basic stuff that you should then think about or, or play with. So I'll leave it at that because I don't want to go too advanced because I think it's what you've seen from this testing the, um, the difference between um, testing and not. So we've gone, um, uh, sorry, from caching. So we've gone 4.2 seconds to 11.6 seconds. So um, that's uh, it's really important to, to do your caching. Now, I'll just also talk to another section, um, which is a content distributed network, CDN. So this is a related um, concept. Um, so CDN is, is a related concept to a cache, and it is usually used in conjunction with a cache. So generally, um, CDN is the next level. So for most websites, a CDN isn't necessary. Um, because once, once if you've got a decent host and you've got a decent cache and you've done, you've optimized images and um, fonts, then you're going to have a pretty fast website. So CDN's a bit of an overkill. So, um, but if you really want to get your website faster and you've done all the things, then the next thing is to do a CDN. And what a CDN does is it grabs as many files as it can on off your website, and it puts it on another server. So in the same way that Cloudflare was working. Um, but what that does is it will put, because a certain ser your server is limited to how many files it can download at once, by putting um, your scripts on one server and your images on another and your HTML on another, it actually means that you can load more files in at once. So if we jump to the, um, oh, sorry, shop screen, share screen. Share screen. So if I jump back to this test, you'll see um, the reason it's called a waterfall test is that um, you can see that nothing loads unless the HTML is loaded. So that makes sense because the HTML actually uh, references all the other all the other files. So it can't load files unless the, it knows what it does. But you can see here it's got one, two, three, four, five, six files. And then it won't load anymore until they're loaded. And then it's loading, then it's limited to how many you can load. And then it, see how it steps? Now those steps are the restriction of the server load. So if you've got a CDN, you can actually load those in, you can bring those steps back to the left. And that means you can load things in um, sooner, which means the overall website will load faster. Uh, and the actual, um, Sorry, the screen didn't share, my apologies. Um, so yeah, here's the thing. So you can see the steps here. Um, so if you use a CDN, you can bring these steps to the left and then you can speed the overall page up. Um, so you, you may have already used CDNs your, like in the part already. So for example, uh, on my webinars, I'm uploading my videos to YouTube and I'm embedding them here. So this is acting like a CDN because the, um, the, YouTube's, the YouTube's hosting my video. So that means that my whole page will load faster. If I uh, host my own video, then I've got to download the video as well as the page and it'll slow everything down. Um, if you install Jetpack, 
uh, the plugin, just a free version, they'll also start doing some CDN stuff. We'll start um, putting some, well, there's some settings, you can switch them on and they'll start putting files back up on your server. I'm sorry, up on um, WordPress's server. So therefore you can speed up, up what you're doing. If you did need a host video on your website, um, so for example, we did a website for, um, for government, it was for a union and now aiming local councils. Now local councils block lots of websites like YouTube. So we needed to host the videos on the website. So we actually then paid for a premium version of Jetpack, which then they host the videos on their server. So basically we're paying Jetpack for a CDN, uh, which then allows our videos to be up on their server, which then um, means that we're not paying for the hosting of the videos and that we're loading them in a lot faster. So that's a CDN. Um, and the thing with uh, Lightspeed, which is this has just come out recently, um, they're moving to be a complete technology where they've got the, um, the, the server side, the WordPress side, and then also a CDN as one um, built-in application. That to me makes sense because you're using one technology. Um, the pricing looks competitive with all the other systems. So again, if you want to go next level, um, so I recommend if you are hosting WordPress that you, and you're you looking for a standard host, then I recommend you find one that supports Lightspeed technology. Um, whether you use CDN or not, because this, that will really speed up your website. All right, so now the next thing is, is what to do uh, when things go wrong. Well, you see the disaster plan. So if you've done your disaster planning, then you will um, know what to do step by step and your team will know what to do. Um, and that is, I've just put the wrong, I've just got the wrong link. Hang on. But I do have, so I've got to fix that link. Um, I've got a disaster plan here. That loads, the zoom makes the website slower. Um, so if you've got problems with your website, so if your website, actually, I'll just go through the, okay, what to do, do in an emergency? Well, don't freak out. Um, because you've got a plan. That's why I've done the disaster plan. So in an emergency, you don't have to freak out. Uh, first thing, um, you got to work on sort of roughly what's wrong with it. If the website's completely out or if the website's broken, now, if the website's broken, then I recommend that you clear all the caches because there may be a bug with the cache, maybe some software is updated and then there's, there's something blah, blah, blah. So clear all the caches. If the website itself is um, completely down, then check the host. So my Pacific host has a um, website I can go to that checks the status of the service. Now, if they've got a red dot next to it, it means that their server's broken and that the techs are aware of it and they're fixing it, at which point I can't do anything about it. Um, if they're still, if they're all green, then you could contact them and say, look, my website's broken. Is, is there something wrong with your, your um, hosting? Because sometimes their automated um, notification systems may have failed. And I've seen that in the past where a host um, says, no, there's nothing wrong with it. And I said, yes, there is. They've checked it and they're going, yeah, actually there is something wrong with it. Um, now, if there's nothing wrong with it um, and you've worked out, well, maybe we've been hacked. Um, so sometimes when people, when bots hack your website, they'll break it accidentally. Now, uh, if, if um, a good hacker, what a hacker wants to do is they don't want to break your website. What they want is your website to stay live and you not notice. So then they can um, feed their viruses and they can feed their um, search optimization, those sort of things. So if they break your website, it's accidental, they didn't mean to, but your website's broken. Or if your website's been hacked, you want to clean it up. So in which case you want to roll back to a backup. So we talked about rolling back before. If you can access the WP admin, then you can just do a rollback using backup buddy. This, this is the simplest and easiest way of doing it. Uh, if you can't access your WP, admin then you can do it on the server level now your planning might be a bit different but this is the one that I'm using um, if that fails contact the host to help you back roll back like if you've totally messed it up ring up your host and or put a support ticket say can you roll it back please they'll sort it um, then you log in and upgrade all your plugins and themes that's making the assumption that 
one of your you didn't update your software and that's how they got hacked so you just want to update everything to make sure that it's secure as possible then you want to change all the passwords because remember bad passwords are one of the main reasons people get hacked so maybe one of your um, one of your staff members or volunteers had a really bad password you reset everyone's password um, then you sit and see what happens if you've if if, if you're more than likely if um, fix that problem so forensics like figuring out how something got hacked is really expensive so you actually don't have that um, you, you, you won't be able to do that so in that context um, just wait and see if it keep an eye on it and if, if it's fine for a few days then you fix the problem now if you've got issues with plugins or if you've got other issues um, if you upgrade your if you then upgrade your plugins and then the problem breaks again so you go okay we haven't been hacked it's a problem with the plugins something like that um, sometimes you have small conflicts or maybe a contact forms not working or something like that um, conflicts uh, between software and themes are reasonably common in WordPress so what you need to do is then go in and switch off every plugin and every theme. When you get back to default WordPress, you know that that's pretty rock solid as far as it's been tested by WordPress, it was going to work. If WordPress without any plugins and themes doesn't work on your host, then there's nothing you can do. You need to contact your host and say, look, WordPress doesn't work on your server. Can you fix it? At that point, it's probably a hosting issue. Um, then what you do is if now WordPress is working, then you switch on the plugins one by one until you see which one caused the problem. So a simpler way of doing that is guessing which plugin may cause the problem and switch that one off first and see if it fixes the problem. Um, now generally if you get support for various plugins, then they'll ask you to switch everything off. So it's quite common for you to switch all the plugins off um, and the theme off. However, your website's live and that means that your website's going to be substandard for a short period of time. Um, but that's generally how you do a debug um, on a WordPress. And, and in the, um, the advanced um, theme plugin, um, themes and plugins webinar, I showed you how to force, how to force disable a plugin. And what that involves is um, logging into your, your host, um, going where your file server is, where your files are. And then you uh, go to wp-content and in there is themes and plugins folder. So WordPress plugins will only work if they're in the proper plugins folder and a WordPress theme will only work if it's in the proper theme folder. If you literally drag that out of the folder or you move that out of that folder, WordPress will automatically disable it. So if you're unable to disable a plugin, um, say it's broken your WP admin, for example, and you can't actually access the admin, then you'll need to log into your server, to your host, log into where your files are, go to WP-content, and in there, the themes and the plugins folder, and then you manually rip them out. And then hopefully they'll get your WordPress working again, and then you can go back through those steps to um, figure out which plugin was the problem. Once you've worked out what plugin's the problem, then you either need to get support to the plugin developers or find a different plugin. Um, and if you're having problems with your cache, um, then start looking at the settings and um, switching some of those settings off. Um, so that's about a wrap. Do we have any questions? Okay, so um, I run these webinars as pay as you feel. Um, so you can pay via a link on our, um, on the emails that I send you and also the donate here. And um, Simon, thank you very much, donated um, some money to me. So that makes me dance, gets excited. Um, if donations aren't appropriate for you or where you're at, it's really important for me that these are free and accessible. So in that case, um, I would really appreciate it if you um, write a review on my Facebook page or leave comments, share on our YouTube and those sort of things. Um, help us get the message out there. Um, so that'd be very much appreciated. And 